my first lesson in reconciliation or restoration or forgiveness was when I was just seven years old. For those Catholics out there and for those moviegoers, you probably know what I'm talking about. Confession. I remember sitting across from the kind old Father Kenneth O'Toole, who actually very often sat across from me at my dining room table. He leaned in and smiled and asked, what sins do you want to confess, Pat? Well, I nervously blurted out, I said, I, I, I don't have any sins, Father, I, 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 I promise. And he smiled back and said, well, why don't you say a few Hail Marys just in case. So here's what I learned from that. One, don't rat yourself out. And two, even if you have one or two sins, reconciliation, forgiveness is just a few Hail Marys away. The sin, the harm that it causes, and the reconciliation it requires is between God, the priest, and you. At least that's how I understood it for a very long time. How did you first understand forgiveness or reconciliation or restoration? Again, that's how I understood it for a very, very long time. Until my organization, the James B. Moran Center for Youth Advocacy, committed to building a restorative community. Now, up until that point, for nearly 40 years, the Moran Center had provided community-based, integrated legal and social work services for disinvested youth and their families. And at that point, when the Moran Center made this strategic decision to build a restorative community, I'd been there for about six years, representing kids in juvenile court and in special education advocacy. I had never participated in a restorative practice, you know, where People sit in circle, and they pass a talking piece, and they resolve conflict. At that point, I realized that this was something important, and I bought in. Now, admittedly, I've only now had about three years' experience. I'm not an elder, but I have sat in hundreds of restorative conversations of all configurations, and I really want to tell you about my experience and, and what I have now seen in a restorative community. A restorative community is a place where we live in just relationship with each other. Now, Brian Stevenson, in his blueprint to change the world, I'm going to borrow from that in order to help us define a restorative community. So a restorative community is a place where we are willing to get proximate to each other. We were willing to be uncomfortable with each other during moments of conflict. In a restorative community, toxic narratives regarding harm and those who perpetrate harm are changed, upended, and systems of dehumanization are dismantled. Now, until recently, I have a lot more experience with systems and communities that otherize and institutionalize and incarcerate rather than restore. Look, I'm a lawyer. So let me tell you about my first couple cases at the Moran Center, representing Jasmine and Curtis. So Jasmine was just 13 years old when after school one day she started stalking Stephanie. Stephanie had been chatting up Jasmine's boyfriend on social media. Jasmine confronted Stephanie. Now, unfortunately, the confrontation got physical, and the two girls started wrestling in front of the school. The assistant principal called Jasmine's grandmother that night and told her that she had been suspended from school for 10 days and that the administration would be meeting at the end of the week to discuss Jasmine's fate. I represented Jasmine and her grandmother at that meeting, and I still remember sitting in that windowless conference room with 20 administrators facing us down. The dean started out by detailing the fight in excruciating detail. And then some other administrator talked about Jasmine's abysmal school attendance record and dismal disciplinary record. Without 
speaking to Jasmine, without hearing from her, the district then decided to outplace Jasmine to an alternative school. I remember turning to Jasmine's grandmother, and I whispered, you can challenge this. She looked back at me, defeated, and shook her head, no. She probably saw the futility of challenging the school district's decision at that point. A few weeks later, Jasmine dropped out of school, and she's been in and out of jail ever since. Now I want you to reimagine. What resolution might we have developed if Jasmine went to a school that valued just relationships? What if she had adults in the building that she had real relationships with? trusting relationships with, relationships where she really felt heard? What if exclusion and shun shunning, shame and disconnection were not options? What if the goal of the entire process was to build, rebuild, and repair broken relationships, to engage all parties in the process, giving all parties an opportunity to be heard, giving all stakeholders an opportunity to, to engage in the process and the outcome? Now Curtis. Curtis was also 13 years old when he went to the public library with his friend Kyle after school one day. They were goofing around at the public computers when all of a sudden the goofing around got a little out of hand. And then wham! Kyle went down on the floor, broke his nose, blood was gushing everywhere, the cops were called. Curtis was arrested for an aggravated battery which in the state of Illinois is a class four felony. And it was a class four felony because the battery occurred on public property. Now, I represented Curtis in juvenile court. And after we lost at trial, the judge sentenced Curtis to one year probation with mandated counseling, mandated anger management counseling, 20 hours of community service, drug testing, a mandated curfew, and monthly probation appointments. Let that settle in. An after-school scuffle resulted in Curtis getting arrested, charged, prosecuted, and then punished for one year. Adding insult to injury, Kyle and Curtis's friendship disintegrated. Now, I want you to reimagine again. What if we chose not to criminalize youthful misbehavior? What if Curtis was not arrested at all, right? What if he was not arrested avoiding the trauma of being arrested, of court surveillance and the ensuing isolation? What if Kyle and not the court determined what Curtis needed to do in order to repair the physical harm and their fractured friendship? Truly meaningful repair, not some assembly line justice. And what if Curtis was held accountable, not by the police, not by the state, not by the court, but by his actual community? And what if the actual community actually invited, and I mean truly invited, Curtis to share what his needs were? So as he could live in just relationship with himself, with Kyle, and with the entire community going forward. You know, Jasmine and Curtis were not given the opportunity to be in proximity to those who they caused harm. You know, and, and no one experienced discomfort except Jasmine and Curtis. And no narratives were changed regarding the harm or those who perpetrate harm. You know, systems just whoo, swooped in and took over. Now I want you to fast forward eight years. I've now seen a long line of kids who've caused harm in our community be given assessments instead of arraignments, resources instead of shackles, meaningful community engagement and inclusion instead of shaming and exclusion, and most importantly, relationships instead of rejection. In partnership with the city of Evanston, the Moran Center successfully advocated for kids to be rerouted 
away from arrest for low-level offenses, instead redirected to a restorative and supportive services program where kids could meaningfully engage and holistically address harms that they had caused. They could also engage in meaningful, individualized community service opportunities and have themselves and their families wrapped in supportive services. Here's what I mean. Here's an example of what I mean by that, okay? Robert stole a bag of potato chips from the corner store. Instead of being cited and fined, or worse yet, arrested and prosecuted, right, this kid was referred to meet with a city social worker, okay? Now, Robert missed that first appointment. <laughs> But the city social worker adorning her K95 mask showed up at Robert's doorstep, getting proximate. Just the simple act of showing up sparked a relationship where Robert really felt that he could divulge what was really going on. And he told her that he stole that bag of potato chips because he was hungry. His family had been going without food for weeks because they had been denied food stamps. So what did the social worker do? The social worker arranged for donated groceries to be delivered to their house, linked the family up to legal services so we could appeal the food stamps denial. Robert then participated in a restorative practice with the local corner store owner. They got proximate, and let me tell you, uncomfortably so. Robert shared his story, the corner store owner shared his, and a repair of harm agreement came out of that circle which actually resulted in Robert working as a paid employee at the corner store. Instead of asking, what rule was broken, right? We asked, what is the harm caused and to whom? What do they deserve was replaced by who has the obligation to address the needs, repair the harm, restore the relationships? and how. See, we change the narrative, and thereby the system. Now, in relentlessly engaging systems and systems players, I've actually seen systems change in real time when restorative values are imparted into the process. Take DJ. We represented DJ, a teenager suffering from debilitating school anxiety causing him to be absent from school quite often. He actually really wanted to go to school, but with no prospect of consistent attendance, we advocated for the school to provide remote learning solutions for DJ. The school resisted, though, and communications broke down. The lawyers, feeling, fearing that our client would be excluded permanently, started sharpening our pencils and preparing that complaint against the district. He never filed that complaint, though. At the prompting of our restorative justice coordinator, Pam Citrenbaum, who happens to be the class of 1988, go Cats, she prompted us to ask for one more meeting from the school district. So we did. And you know what? Miraculously, the school district agreed. So thanks to Pam, there we were in the same room, proximate. And let me tell you, uncomfortable. This time, though, Pam opened the meeting differently. She centered DJ. She centered DJ's voice and give, gave everybody in that room, especially the school district, the opportunity to change the narrative about DJ. Here's how Pam started that meeting. DJ is so excited to come back to school. Let's welcome him back. Let's remind him he is known here. Pam then invited all 18 administrators sitting around that table, teachers, social workers, case managers, to share some strength that they had noticed and recognized in DJ. Here's what they said. DJ is insightful, curious, hardworking, focused, has a sharp wit, is respected by classmates, reads text deeply, has a great laugh. She then asked DJ if he recognized himself in those descriptions. And he nodded. The room was transformed. By the end of that meeting, the school district had offered 
remote learning instructions to engage DJ, who had finally been heard and seen as a rightful member of his school community. If we're proximate to each other, if we know each other's stories, if we see and hear each other in our full humanity, even when it's uncomfortable, if we are in relationship with each other, systems that just narrate for us, that limit the parameters of what we're capable of as community members, and that often dehumanize us, will radically change. Community will be rightfully centered. Brian Stevenson, in his blueprint to change the world, lastly calls on us to remain hopeful. That's what restorative justice is, hope. Hope that we can be in authentic and just relationship with each other. Hope that we can reimagine systems that are built on authentic and just relationships. Hope in the capacity for human transformation. So I ask you, how will you join the movement for building restorative communities? What systems, what what neighborhoods, what relationships are you in that you could bring restorative values to right now? You know, don't worry, at least not at first, about the traditions, the rituals of restorative practices. They will come with time, with learning and experience. But just start with the values. In 2016, the Moran Center honored America's leading anti-death penalty activist, Sister Helen Pergine. In her acceptance speech, she said the following, my salvation is embedded in the salvation of all human beings. We cannot talk about individual salvation since we are tied with a thousand strings to each other and to creation as a whole. That's it. That's the lesson. We are all tied to each other. So we must strive to be in just relationship with each other and create communities that support, nurture, and cultivate just relationships. This is not just a means to an end. This is an end to itself. So let's reimagine. Thank you. <laughs>